Welcome to this session of MD310 Medical Care Provider, Chest Pain and Difficulty Breathing. By the end of this session, you will be able to identify at least eight diseases or processes that can cause chest pain and or difficulty breathing. You'll be able to list five signs of severe illness in a patient who's complaining of chest pain or difficulty breathing, and you'll be able to at least list at least five steps of both the initial and the ongoing care of a patient complaining of chest pain and or difficulty breathing with signs of severe illness. You should already be familiar with the anatomy of the chest, but just as a brief review, the chest is the other upper part of the thoracoabdominal cavity, continuous cavity that starts at your shoulders and ends at the base of your pelvis. Anatomically, uh, it's divided from the abdomen by the diaphragm, so that large muscle that causes the lungs to expand and contract divides the thoracoabdominal cavity into the thorax or chest and the abdomen. Topographically, they're divide, it's, the chest is divided from the abdomen by a range, and that range depends on where the diaphragm is when you're breathing. So at maximum exhalation, your diaphragm may be all the way up at about your nipple line, and at maximum inhalation, it may be all the way down to your umbilicus or belly button. So abdominal diseases can cause chest pain. This is a cross-sectional view of the thoracic cavity and about the mid-thorax. You can see the chest wall. The patient's right is on the left side of your screen. The patient's left is on the right side of your screen. And the upper part of the screen is the patient's anterior surfaces. So in the center, we have the heart. Right behind that, coming down, that white circle is the aorta. Big blood vessel, it forms an arch at the top of the heart, takes blood away from the heart to the rest of the body. You have lungs on the right and left with bronchi, the air carrying tubes going out into them. And those small white areas are blood vessels in the, in the gray of the lungs. The lungs are surrounded by pleura, the two part lining that wraps the lungs and is attached on one side to the lungs. And then the other part is attached to the chest wall. You can see ribs and the big white bones in the back are the spine, and then this is all surrounded by muscle. In any patient complaining of chest pain or shortness of breath, you perform your immediate initial assessment, control exsanguinating bleeding, manage the airway, breathing, circulation, disability or neurologic status, and expose them to look for further disease and then protect them from the environment. If they are in cardiac arrest, you begin CPR as you normally would. You need to determine if the cause of their chest pain or shortness of breath is trauma or if this is a non-traumatic medical event. And then you need to do a focused history and physical exam. And if the patient is ill-appearing, you do this quickly. And the following are typical signs of severe illness. The patient can be what's called shocky, and that's something that you have to see to really recognize. But they'll be pale, they'll be clammy, confused and disoriented. They may be irritable and those things come from not enough blood flow to the brain because the patient is in shock. They may have blue lips and blue fingers, cyanosis. Well, we would say the patient is cyanotic, and that sign of not enough oxygen in the bloodstream or not enough oxygen flowing to those areas. And if they have obvious respiratory distress, you can hear wheezing, you can hear crackles, or you hear nothing at all when they try to breathe. Those are all very significant signs of severe illness. So we'll go through causes of chest pain and shortness of breath. This is not a comprehensive list, but these are very common causes. Uh, the first is asthma. Asthma basically is a disease where the bronchi, the big air tubes that bring air from the mouth down into the lungs, get inflamed, and then the walls go into spasm. It's a chronic disease. In some people, they require everyday medication to control it. Other people only need medication when they get sick. And in the extreme, it's very life-threatening and can be very difficult to manage. A patient with an asthma attack will complain of shortness of breath. They may say they can hear themselves wheeze and their chest will feel tight, like they can't get it to move or get enough air in. And there may be a trigger. For a lot of people who have stable asthma, there's an environmental allergy that triggers it or they get a cold, a viral upper respiratory infection, or an exposure of some sort, and they may be able to identify that. On exam, 
The exam may be fairly unremarkable, except for wheezing, but they may also be, if they're sicker, uh, tachycardic, have a high heart rate, tachypnic, have a high breathing rate, and hypoxic, have low oxygen levels in their blood. You may hear wheezing, which is a musical sound when they breathe, or you may hear nothing at all, and that's called silent chest, and that's very bad because it means they're not moving any air at all. The skin may be pulling in under their ribs or between their ribs because they're trying so hard to breathe. The treatment, X, A, B, C, D, E, inhaled albuterol, either with an inhaler or a nebulizer if you have it. Steroids, either oral or IV, they take several hours to kick in, but they help with the inflammation. The albuterol helps immediately with the spasm of the walls, what's called bronchospasm. IV fluids, if they've been sick for a while, because many of them are dehydrated. If they're very sick, intramuscular epinephrine, like you would use for anaphylaxis. And if there's an allergic trigger, you can consider adding an antihistamine. Another cause of chest pain and shortness of breath is a pneumothorax, air in the thorax, specifically air where it shouldn't be. This is a collapsed lung. And this is a problem where either there's trauma and there's a hole from the outside in through the chest wall or a hole through the lung, which can be caused either by trauma or can happen for medical reasons. And what happens is air leaks into that space between the, the two layers of the pleura and they expand and so the lung pulls away from the chest wall and when the person breathes they're no longer pulling the lung with the chest wall so the lung isn't working but they suck air into that space and that air becomes trapped so the lung can't expand and if enough air gets trapped in that space it can actually act like an overinflated balloon and start to push the heart and the great vessels uh, the aorta and the vena cava over into the other side of the chest and when they do that they kink those blood vessels and that can cause the person to die. Typically the person will complain of sudden sharp chest pain at one spot with shortness of breath and they may be able to tell you that there was trauma uh, either blunt or penetrating to the chest. On your exam if there was trauma you may find evidence of trauma. You may find decreased breath sounds on the affected side. I've had many patients with large pneumothoraces and you can't hear the difference because the air in the chest cavity transmits the normal breath sounds from the other side. But if you do hear a difference, so less breath sounds on the affected side, that's an important finding. Your treatment, X, A, B, C, D, E, give oxygen, pain medications, and if they look like they're in shock, they have a fast heart rate, they're irritable, or their oxygen levels are low, they need what's called chest decompression and immediate evacuation. What's chest decompression? It's just what it sounds like. It's taking a long needle, like that large white needle with the orange hub, and sticking it through the chest wall and into the pleural space. And so you find either the top of the third rib in the midclavicular line or the top of the fifth rib in the mid-axillary line on the affected side and you go over the rib to keep from damaging blood vessels and nerves underneath it. You insert the needle all the way down to the hub on the chest and with these needles they are over the needle catheters so you remove the metal needle from the inside and leave the catheter in the chest. When you're done hopefully you get air bubbling out sometimes mixed with a little bit of blood and the patient gets better. Uh, ideally, that fixes the problem. The problem is, is these catheters can clot off, and so if the patient starts getting sick again, you may need to do the procedure again with another catheter. Just leave the clotted off catheter in place. One of the higher risk causes of chest pain and shortness of breath in the maritime industry, due to the amount of travel that uh, you tend to do in getting to various assignments is pulmonary embolism. And what happens is our body doesn't have a pump to push blood back from the veins in the lower extremities. So it uses the muscles and movements of the muscles. And if the legs are kept still, the blood sits in those veins and can stagnate and clot. And so it can form clots in the veins of the legs and the pelvis. 
And if you start moving again, or even if you don't, those break loose, they float, float through the right side of the heart, and then they get lodged in the pulmonary arteries because those arteries are getting smaller and smaller as they go to the capillary beds in the lungs. And that stops blood flow to the lungs, and depending on how big the uh, clot is and where it gets lodged, it can completely stop blood flow to the lungs. Uh, it typically, it won't cause stroke or a heart attack because it gets wedged in the lungs. It doesn't travel through to the left side of the heart and then get into the systemic circulation. So risk factors include travel, smoking, birth control, oral contraceptives, so the hormones, hormone replacement therapy, a patient who's bed bound or anyone who's had recent surgery. And so those are, those are real considerable risks for uh, people in the maritime industry. The patient will present with a history of sudden severe chest pain, although sometimes it's less severe if it's a small clot. It's typically worse when they breathe. They also feel suddenly short of breath. They may be coughing up blood, although not always. They may complain or you may find unilateral pain and swelling in a leg. Or they may pass out if the clot's large enough. Uh, the clots can cause release of a lot of hormones and things that cause the blood vessels to dilate, and people can pass out from that. These patients on exam may be tachycardic, have a fast heart rate, or tachypnic, a fast respiratory rate, and may be hypoxic, have a low oxygen level. But they may also have normal vital signs if it's a smaller clot. And one of the things in emergency medicine is we don't worry about the clot you have now, that clot didn't kill you. We worry about the next clot that's waiting to break loose because that one could. So a small clot is a warning sign that a bigger clot could be coming. You may find because of the pain that they don't take deep breaths, so poor inspiration on your lung exam. And if you find a swollen or tender leg or calf that's on one side, that is a red flag. So treatment, X, A, B, C, D, E, give them oxygen. The only anticoagulant that you have is aspirin, so consider giving them 324 milligrams of aspirin. Uh, that will help keep clots from extending, and these patients need to be immediately evacuated. Now, the biggest concern with chest pain, uh, especially in an older population above 40, is coronary artery disease. And coronary artery disease, which is disease of the vessels that specifically feed the heart, the coronary arteries, can be broken down into two major groups, angina and a heart attack. In angina or angina, the coronary arteries narrow. You get what are called plaques in the coronary arteries. They build up over time and they decrease blood flow. It's a simple plumbing problem. So if you start to do activities where the heart needs more oxygen, you just simply can't flow enough blood and enough oxygen to those parts of the heart. So you get chest pain. But when you stop and the oxygen demand decreases and now this narrow plumbing can meet that demand, the symptoms go away. So on history, these patients typically have a prior history of angina, not always. Uh, they'll often be diabetic or they may have hypertension. But they may also have no other disease processes. They get their symptoms with activity, which can be chest pain and shortness of breath. And those symptoms will resolve with rest and over time. So your typical symptoms, heaviness or squeezing in the chest. It can go to the jaw, arms, or back. It can be associated with shortness of breath, sweats, nausea, vomiting, or a feeling of impending doom, and upper abdominal discomfort. And in fact, for women and diabetics, atypical presentations are more common, and they're only considered atypical because they aren't based on the typical male presentation, these patients often will have upper abdominal discomfort, nausea or vomiting, or just a vague feeling of disquiet in their upper abdomen or chest. Typically, these patients will have a completely normal exam. Something called a hypertensive emergency can cause uh, chest pain from coronary artery disease, so they may be hypertensive and that may be part of the problem. And they may have sweats, depending on how significant the findings are. And they, they may have other vital sign abnormalities. But more often than not, their exam will be completely normal. The treatment is rest. And that rest often decreases the oxygen demand enough that the heart pain goes away altogether. Nitroglycerin, oxygen, morphine if it's needed, if they're having a lot of pain, and aspirin if their pain is significant. What do you do with these patients? Well, if they have a history of angina, the symptoms are the same as they've always been in the past. They come on with the same amount of activity. They go away with rest. 
they're not more severe, they're not more frequent, and they resolve after one to two nitroglycerin, then talk to medical control. These patients may not need to be evacuated. But if they don't have a history of angina, or the symptoms are different than usual, or they take more than two nitroglycerin, then they'll need evacuation. Now the heart attack is the other major manifestation of coronary artery disease. And what happens is those same plaques, although usually much smaller, rupture in the coronary artery disease. So a little bit of the cap that's over them, it's called a fibrin cap, tears off and a clot forms right above that tear inside the blood vessel and completely blocks it. So there's no blood flow downstream. And in a heart attack, because there's no blood flow at all, that part of the heart dies. So typically this will occur in patients with a prior history of angina, although not always because these are smaller plaques, oftentimes one that don't cause angina, or a history of diabetes or hypertension, or maybe no medical history at all. And the key difference between this and angina is that the symptoms don't resolve with time or rest. They continue. And we typically use 20 minutes as the cutoff time. Any pain that lasts longer than 20 minutes, there's heart damage going on. It's not just decreased blood flow to the heart. So your typical symptoms are identical to those of someone with angina. And again, women and diabetics may have more abdominal symptoms, more anxiety symptoms, more feeling of disquiet than males do. Most patients having heart attacks look completely normal on their exam. Normal vital signs, normal physical findings. Sometimes they'll be, they'll have abnormal vital signs, either high blood pressure, which is part of the cause, or low blood pressure, and they may be sweaty, but more often than not, I find these patients to have completely normal exam. And treatment is rest, just because you don't want to increase oxygen demand, and then MONA, treats every one of these patients, M-O-N-A, morphine for pain control, oxygen, nitroglycerin, aspirin. Aspirin decreases the risk of death by 50% in a heart attack. And so it's very important that patients get these, uh, get their aspirin, and they need to be evacuated immediately. Now patients may also have shortness of breath and sometimes chest pain because of what's called heart failure. The problem is the heart can't squeeze. And this can be something that develops over a long time, or it can be something that happens suddenly and is what's called acute. Um, either way, if the left side of the heart can't squeeze, blood backs up into the lungs, and if that backs up far enough and the right side of the heart can't squeeze enough, or if there's right-sided heart failure, the blood will back up into the venous side of the body. So these patients will typically complain of shortness of breath uh, if it's backing up from the left side, and swelling in their limbs, uh, particularly the legs, if it's backing up on the right. They may have a PMH or past medical history of coronary artery disease, CAD, diabetes mellitus or DM, hypertension or HTN, or congestive heart failure, CHF. On exam, these patients will often be in respiratory distress. Their heart rate will be fast, their blood pressure will be up, they'll be breathing quickly, and they'll be hypoxic. You can often hear crackles in the lungs, which sound like a bubbling sound when they breathe. They may have pink, frothy spit that's coming up, and that's foam coming out of their lungs tinged with blood because there's so much pressure in the lungs. And they may have bilateral leg swelling. And this can sometimes happen because of a heart attack, particularly in someone with no history. If this happens suddenly, think of that, about the fact that they may be having a heart attack at the same time. The treatment for heart failure, X, A, B, C, D, E, as always, and you may be stuck on airway, breathing, and circulation for the entire time you take care of them. If you can, let their legs dangle and sit their head up. And the reason for this is that theoretically you can make some of that extra blood pool in their legs in the venous system, and that decreases the amount of pressure in the lungs. Give them oxygen, give them nitroglycerin, lots and lots of nitroglycerin. If their blood pressure is above 100 systolic, nitroglycerin is what's going to shift that, blood, that extra blood pressure out of their lungs and into the rest of their body. Aspirin, because they may be having a heart attack, you may need to help them breathe with positive pressure ventilation. 50% of these people have a problem with the distribution of the fluid in their body. So there's not too much fluid in their body, it's just in the wrong places. 
but the other 50% actually have total body fluid overload. And so if it looks like there's total body fluid overload, medical control may have you give a medication called furosemide or Lasix to help get rid of the extra fluid. And these patients need to be immediately evacuated, but it'll be pretty obvious. You don't want to keep them around any longer than you have to. There are also other pulmonary or lung causes of shortness of breath. COPD stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. You'll sometimes see it written as COLD, chronic obstructive lung disease, but COPD is the more common term. And there's two major types, emphysema and chronic bronchitis. In chronic bronchitis, you get chronic excess mucus production, filling up the bronchi, and some bronchospasm. And in emphysema, you get chronic bronchospasm, so the airways are squeezing down and trying to close up. Generally, these patients will have a history of COPD. When their symptoms come on, occasionally they'll come on as a sudden severe COPD exacerbation, but for most of them, the symptoms develop over a few days before they get really bad. And there may be a trigger, uh, environmental exposure, uh, cold, uh, rhinorrhea, upper respiratory infection. Rhinorrhea is a runny nose, um, and those may be the causes. On exam, their heart rates typically will be fast, they'll be breathing quickly, and they'll be hypoxic, and you can usually hear wheezing, and sometimes in the chronic bronchitis, you'll hear some crackling. Treatment, XABCDE, albuterol to open up the airways as much as you can, steroids to decrease the inflammation. If they have a fever, you add antibiotics, and if these patients are that sick, they're most likely going to need evacuation. Very rarely will you get one turned around enough that the case is so mild that they can stay shipboard. Infections in the lung can also cause chest pain or shortness of breath. Pneumonia is the one that we worry most about. And what happens is bacteria from your mouth and throat defeat the defense mechanisms that your lungs have and the bacteria get down in there and they cause an infection in the lung that can be spread to the rest of the body through the bloodstream. Sometimes it happens the other way, that something from the bloodstream gets into the lung, but that's unusual. Um, these patients will often have chest pain, shortness of breath, and a cough. They'll often have a fever. These patients can be very difficult to distinguish from someone with an acute bronchitis. Acute bronchitis is almost always caused by a virus, and the problem with acute bronchitis uh, is the bronchi get inflamed. And so while the treatment is theoretically different, in your situation without access to x-rays, it's very hard to tell the difference between the two. On exam, a patient with pneumonia will typically have a fever. Their heart rate will often be up, as will be their respiratory rate. And if it's big enough, they'll be hypoxic. And if you listen to their lungs, you may hear one area where you hear crackles, the <laughs> noise when they're breathing that you don't hear anywhere else, or you might hear a little bit of wheezing <laughs> in one part of the lung that you don't hear anywhere else. So the treatment, X, A, B, C, D, E, oxygen if their oxygen levels are low, antibiotics, oral, or if they're very sick, IV, and if they have a, a walking pneumonia or they, they otherwise appear healthy, you may well be able to just treat them with oral antibiotics and they don't need evacuation. But if they're sick at all uh, and they seem very ill to you, they've got any of those warning signs of severe illness, then you'll need to evacuate them. One cause of chest pain that you won't be able to do much about but can certainly happen is thoracic aortic dissection. What happens is your aorta forms an arch, comes out of the top of your heart from the left ventricle and then goes out to give blood to the rest of the body. And the, all your blood vessels are made up of three layers and the arteries have an interior layer called the intima. And in a thoracic aortic dissection, that intima tears off the next layer and blood flows into that new space so it collapses, can collapse closed the normal lumen, it creates what's called a false lumen. And so you get decreased blood flow. And if that tear goes backwards, it can go into the coronary arteries. And so you get decreased blood flow to the heart. If it goes out through the carotid arteries up the neck, it can cut off blood flow to the brain. If it goes out to your arms, it can cut off blood flow to the arms. If it goes down into 
the abdomen, it can cut off blood flow to your kidneys or gut. So what gets affected depends on which direction the tear is going and how far it goes. The classic history is sudden severe chest pain, tearing sensation radiating to the back. Not all patients have that. Anyone with chest pain and true neurologic symptoms, numbness, tingling, numbness, loss of sensation or weakness, particularly in one extremity and not the other, you need to be very concerned about this. On exam, the patient will often be hypertensive because hypertension is the leading cause of thoracic aortic dissection. However, depending on where the tear starts, you may have some very interesting physical findings. If the tear starts after the subclavian artery has come off to the right arm, the right arm might have normal pulses and a normal blood pressure, but the left arm gets blocked off and does not has a low blood pressure or no pulses. Or if the dissection starts below the level of the aorta where the blood flow comes to the arms, both arms may have normal blood pressure and normal pulses, and the legs may have no blood pressure and no pulses. You may also find that these patients have a completely normal exam. Your treatment, if you think this is what's going on, X, A, B, C, D, E, oxygen, IV fluids, and immediate evacuation. Now, most of the causes we've discussed so far are pretty bad, but there are some not bad and far more common causes of chest pain as well. So musculoskeletal pain is pretty common. You get irritation of the muscles, of the cartilage of the chest wall, or you get isolated rib fractures. And this can happen from trauma or coughing or just excessive use of the chest walls for lifting and carrying, twisting and turning. And so typically there'll be chest pain that's in one area. It's worse when you move. It's worse if you take a deep breath. If there was trauma, there may be a trauma history. And on exam, you find an area with focal tenderness and you may find evidence of trauma. Um, your treatment, X, A, B, C, D, E. If it's severe trauma, we'll talk about that elsewhere. Otherwise, make sure there's not something else going on through good history. Discuss this with medical control and the patient needs pain medications, NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and maybe something stronger to help them sleep. Pleurisy is also common and causes chest pain. And what happens is those two layers of the pleura can become inflamed and then rub together and cause pain in that area. Typically, this follows a viral upper respiratory infection or uh, quite a bit of coughing. The patient will point to one spot and say it hurts right there. It's worse with deep breathing. And typically, these patients are not short of breath except when they take a deep breath. If you say to them, if you breathe normally, does your breathing feel all right? They'll usually say yes. But when I take a deep breath, I feel like I can't catch my breath because it hurts. The exam is usually normal. Sometimes you'll have some focal tenderness if you can push hard enough to get that area to rub together. Treatment, X, A, B, C, D, E. Make sure you're right because a pulmonary embolus can present exactly the same way. So you've got to make sure there's no risk factors and no other physical findings. And then non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen are appropriate. As we discussed, Problems in the stomach uh, and the abdomen can also cause chest pain. So gastritis, peptic ulcer disease, or PUD, and GERD, or gastroesophageal reflux disease, can all cause symptoms of chest pain. So gastritis and peptic ulcer disease are typically diseases of excessive acid production in the stomach. Peptic ulcer disease may be related also to a stomach wall infection with a bacteria called H. pylori. The stomach lining gets either inflamed or damaged, and you get this pain in the upper abdomen, lower chest. If you have acid flowing back up into the food pipe, the esophagus, the lower part of that can get burned, as can the whole thing, and you get GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and that can cause the esophagus to spasm and cause an incredible, incredibly tight chest pain. Typical history for GERD, is heartburn symptoms, bad taste in the mouth in the morning, and a lot of alcohol use uh, for gastritis and peptic ulcer disease, alcohol use, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory use, an aching pain in the center of the stomach that sometimes feels better after milk or eating and gets worse. And sometimes they'll describe dark stools that are maroon colored or black and tarry, uh, which would mean bleeding from the stomach. So on exam, 
You'll find tenderness over the epigastrum, the area of the stomach above the belly button and just below the bottom of the rib cage. Now with GERD, you may not find anything at all. Treatment, XABCDE, make sure you're right. You can give an antacid, a uh, medication called H2 blockers like uh, ranitidine or a proton pump inhibitor. Uh, both, of, both of those types of medications stop acid production in the stomach. The last cause of chest pain and shortness of breath we'll talk about is anxiety, which is an excessive emotional response to emotional or physical stimuli, and it is a response of fear and excessive concern. The history is of chest pain, shortness of breath. The patient may complain that they were breathing very fast and felt they couldn't catch their breath. Because of that, they may have hand, face, and foot tingling, and they may or may not have a history of anxiety. On exam, they may be anxious appearing. You may find nothing at all. If they are hyperventilating, breathing really quickly, that causes calcium to move around in the body and the hands and feet can go into spasm, into claws that are extremely painful and they can't straighten out their hands or their wrists and it's very disturbing to patients. Your treatment is to rule out everything else, coach them to slow down and they may need medications to control their anxiety. We will now complete a brief knowledge review to make sure that this material makes sense to you.